So what is money is a profound question, and it's going to vary across time, obviously. Money is the most important message that you'll ever send to somebody. Mm -hmm. it's, the most, it's the most important thing that you're going to be There's a new definition for money right there. Never <laughs> heard that one. And ultimately, I think the best money is often the one that people most desire. Money is at least a really important perceptual apparatus. But um, a fascinating subject, right? What, what is money? The highest form of energy that humans can channel. But it's hard. It's hard to deliver that idea. I mean, again, this is why I named the show What Is Money? Because I could say that to somebody. I'm like, hey, we need money. We can't counterfeit. Because gold is real money. Paper currency isn't real money. It's a promissory note from a bank backed by politicians. And even that, people are like, why? What does it matter? And it's because they don't understand they don't understand what money is. But I think money tends to exacerbate whatever state you're currently in. Uh, and so that's the reason I wrote my book on that, to say, look, this is what money is, this is how it works, uh, and this is how it's being degraded. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. I never really thought much about uh, what is money until you asked me. And uh, then we sat down for this podcast. I thought it'd be a couple of hours, and it, it turned out to be like 18 hours or something like that. And then we eventually did 25 hours. And... Um, at, Everything we did in those sessions uh, was pretty much based upon an outline that I just quickly reeled off in the first hour. I just created an outline of of a bunch of things I wanted to cover, and then and then the rest is just extemporaneous. So it's kind of interesting what comes out extempore. And when I looked at the transcript or this this uh, book you put together, it's four hundred pages long, and I thought that's a lot of words. <laughs> a lot of words but um a fascinating subject right what, what is money um the highest form of energy that humans can channel right money is energy a monetary system is an energy system and as soon as you start thinking about money as an energy system if you're an engineer the next thing that pops up is you start thinking about, about um, every other energy system, hydraulic energy systems, water, electricity, 
thermodynamic energy systems, mechanical energy systems, uh, and the like. And there are so many lessons to learn from all those other energy systems that um, that uh, just just as um, starting with the observation that money is energy and a monetary system is an energy transfer system to move energy through time and space and or uh, to vibrate energy on a given frequency or to program energy, redirect energy. Once you get that idea, right, you think about pulley systems and you know, and what a pulley system allows one person to haul a, a weight which is 10x more than they could pick up without that pulley system. So mechanical advantage and block and tackle and leverage. And, uh, and then, you know, what are the techniques for redirecting energy? I'm going to pull down, but I want, uh, I want the energy vector uh, to move in, out from me, right? How, how do I do that? Um, that's that's a, a subject that engineers deal with all the time, right? Mechanical engineers, civil engineers, nuclear engineers, aeronautical engineers, ocean engineers. They're always dealing with energy and materials, and they study it with a great deal of discipline and there are right and wrong answers, right? There are mathematics matters and there are laws of physics and, and you can't cheat. Um, you know, there's always the, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, right? You, you know, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can only transform uh, it, uh, transform the nature of it. And, and once you uh, accept that, right, you realize that the, I mean, the number one rule of thermodynamics is you can't cheat. Right? You just cannot cheat. And uh, engineers know this and they design all their systems with that in mind. There's no shortcuts. There is no such thing as a free lunch, as Heinlein would say in his books. Um, and every aeronautical engineer knows you want the plane to go further then you're going to have to give up some payload or you're going to have to change the material and you want it to, to go faster then you're going to give up you know, some degree of safety and making it go faster. So engineers live in this world, but um, economists don't. And money has traditionally been the province of economists, or at least in our modern world, economists and politicians. You know, we have we have lawyers in charge of the money supply. You know, economists, lawyers, politicians are considered to be qualified to run the mon monetary system the bank you know the banking system the money system and the money supply but if you actually just accepted the idea that money is energy and a monetary system is an energy network then you would actually think that i ought to put an engineer in charge of that and um Bitcoin's the first time when anybody figured out how to engineer a monetary system. And Satoshi is, a, is an engineer, right? I mean, a, a multifaceted engineer that had a pretty good familiarity, not just with economics and politics, but had a good familiarity with mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science and cybernetics systems and servo mechanisms and stability and feedback and you know, for first order stability is something that you that you absolutely have to understand if you're an aeronautical engineer. When you design an airplane, if it's stable, it means when the plane tilts 10 degrees to the left, the um, the lift on the wing builds up to bring the airplane back to center. And if it's stable, it'll tend to fly true and, and upright. And if it's unstable, when it tilts 10 degrees to the left, it'll tend to tilt 20 degrees more to the left, and then it'll just flip and go into a, a spiral, a death spiral, and crash into the ground, you'll die. And so lack of stability uh, typically means the plane crashes and burns. And in, uh, in ocean engineering, when you build a ship, you want stability so that when the ship, you know, pitches, you know, 10 degrees to the to one side, it tends to want to come back and you know, to stability, to a, to a neutral point, stable point. Uh, and if it does that, right, then it's going to not capsize. But if it's unstable, the, you know, if you get the center of gravity too high, 
uh, or the center of mass too high in the ship, it, it, you know, you tilt 20 degrees to the left or, or, or something like that. You get a roll uh, and the, the thing just rolls over. So um, not, not engineering systems with stability is a death sentence in the engineering world, but uh, in the monetary world, not getting the stability right is a political inconvenience and you just kick the can down the road and leave it to the next person. And ultimately, the result is the monetary system collapses. But if it takes 10 or 20 or 30 years, you're not there and you can just blame it on something else. So, so I think the question really um, had a big impact on me, as you can tell. And, um, and the result was whatever, 25 hours of content and 400 pages of stuff. And uh, last I checked on YouTube, it looks like we have 250,000 people viewed it. So that was uh, quite surprising. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, quite tremendous. And I, I find it interesting that this is just a relatively simple question about something that we all use and think through every day takes you straight into the, you know, some of the most primordial substances. We were talking about time and space and energy, feedback systems, et cetera. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really appreciated the framing. We were talking about Bitcoin moving us from politically run money to a appropriately engineered monetary system. Money is at least a really important perceptual apparatus. All right, I've, I've brought up the term price signals a lot, but we think through money, right? Mm. It's almost like we, when you see, and this is stock markets, right? You're looking at the prices of things changing. You don't know the story behind that. You don't know the natural disasters or the new production uh -huh. facilities or the new trade agreements yeah. that led to that price. All you know is the price. And, you know, often in markets, they say price is truth. So it's mm. like the ultimate economic telecommunications device, the pricing system. And this is, again, what allocates capital intelligent, intelligently in a capitalistic marketplace, a thing that socialism cannot do. Well, all of that communication is occurring through money, right? We're speaking through dollars or whatever currency it is. So I don't know that there's a relationship between money and consciousness per se, but there's at least one between money and perception. Like it radically, it lets us see the world through the eyes of others. Yeah. Like, and there's a, see one there price. may be a relationship between perception and, and, and reality. Yes. So. so everyone involved with the, the cotton price goes up $2. I, That's interesting. Seeing the world through all the eyes of cotton producers and consumers, and where they're where the market is clearing between them, and that's uh -huh. a very that's powerful extremely interesting data compression mechanism, right? You can see yeah. the eyes of so many people in one number. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. So when when you say price, I'm translating in my head to worth, but you're you, you no, say no, so don't. The price is an exchange ratio. So instead of saying this house costs 11 cars, right? Because everything trades at some ratio of everything else. You say mm -hmm. house is $440,000 mm -hmm. equal to 11 of these $40,000 cars. So it's money is like a, an a economic language of, of numeracy, right? A common economic language of numeracy in a way. And so instead of okay. all these ratios, like how many chairs is a house cost and house is a, car cost you just say the price and money and it's easier to perform economic calculation it's uh, again it, there's reciprocal feedback though because all this this distillation of market actions gets compressed into the price but then the price is also informing all those market actors what to do right right right, right? Yeah. so if yeah. the price is up then i'm going to consume less produce more and vice versa if it's down so it's this feedback. You're talking about centralization, decentralization earlier. It's like everything centralizes to the price, but then it informs the decentralized actions of, of all those market participants. Okay. And so it's really, it's just like a never ending feedback loop, I guess. Uh -huh. And it, that's probably how cognition works in some way. I'm not, you know, I'm not super familiar on this, but it, again, I would call that distributed cognition. Right, you've got yeah. a bunch of minds interconnected by the price signal, and they're mm -hmm. moving in concert based on how that price moves. So it's you've wired together a distributed cognitive network, 
I would imagine the individual cognitive network works some in some way similar to that. The vote you cast with your wallet matters much more than the ballot you cast. So if there's yeah. an if there's an institution that can print money at the heart of the economy, then it's effectively voter fraud, right? The more money they print, the more they're defrauding the voting mechanism that is the marketplace. And you know, as you're going through that explanation of the different individuals that are currently in charge, the word corrupt comes up a lot. And we know, you know, what Lord Acton said that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if money, you know, one of the things money is clearly is an, is an instrument of power or a tool of power. So if we have corrupt money, it's not that surprising to me that we have so many corrupt characters at the top of the political hierarchies. Um, so, you know, I would argue, as I do argue, that we need some incorruptible money to fix this, fix these problems, let's say at the root, rather than just hack at the leaves. Well, that's certainly needed. Um, Bitcoin is complex enough, although once you penetrate the jargon and get your head around the principles, it's sort of obvious in a way. It's like money that can't be printed in a world flooded with printed money or, or cannot be counterfeited in a world flooded with counterfeit currency, something like that. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to deliver that idea. You know, it, it's, I mean, again, this is why I named the show. What is money? Because I could say that to somebody I'm like, Hey, we need money. We can't counterfeit. And even that people are like, why, what does it matter? And it's because they don't understand they don't understand what money is, right? If you understand what money is, you understand that counterfeiting the money is the equivalent of stealing from the saver, the person using the money for savings. So all of a sudden yeah. you realize, hey, I've got dollars in the bank account. I'm one of the victims. And I, I think if you could just install that one idea in everyone's or most everyone's mind, this goes to that old Henry Ford quote that he said something to the effect of, I believe if that everyone in the United States understood how the banking system operated, there'd be a revolution before the morning. Like if you just understood money and banking, you would, and you're a depositor in a bank, then you should be royally pissed. So as long as we act as if, you know, the government has power, then well, the government's going to have power. As long as we act as if uh, maybe this money is useful, then it's going to be useful. Now there's some real, it's not like, I, it's such a hard thing to talk about because it's not purely a belief system. It's not like you just believe whatever you want. Like, let's all believe bananas are money. That's not going to work because bananas don't have, there's objective qualities that we desire in money that bananas lack, for instance. So there's this weird sort of feedback between our subjective stories that we're creating and then objective reality. And we live somewhere in between. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I want to unpack that a little bit in, in a very um, straightforward way. Like what Gerard mean, you know, um, desire in, in, in the mimetic way. Um, like what object should be desired, right? It, I think we need to define that. If, if an object is infinite, uh, you lack desire because it's infinite. You, you're you're kind of like, you don't want to desire something that is you know, um, abundant, right? You desire something that's scarce, right? So when, when people like desire for the object, they desire for scarcity of, you know, of that object. It doesn't really, if an object is, is, is kind of infinite, we, we, won't, we won't even desire it. We won't even think about, we won't even have that kind of desire. So the desire over an object, the desire over a scarcity, Right. If you desire something that is scarce, that's often time happens in the, in the in the free market. Right. Free market would decide uh, this, which one is most scarce, and and how you how, how you gonna you know uh, know things that are scarce is because you know uh, it's hard to get, also it's expensive to get. Right. Um, so what what would draw really means about you know uh, desire over something. It's desire over scarce object, and and that desire over scarce object create conflict over that object. For example, right, gold you know is relatively scarce, and um, you know if 
there's all there's only like maybe there's a hundred ounces of gold in, in the in the safe, and the two guys wanted it bad because you know it, it, you can you can sell it at expensive price and it's scarce. And it's why like you know civilization countries rich rich people poor people fight over it and, and think about it like you know this is a because gold is scarce so we all wanted it and and when we all wanted it it become exchangeable money right and that's when you know when when you think about money is scarce that's why you desire and if you think about like you know non scarce money right you won't you won't desire it um but you still think you know it is usable uh, but you won't desire you you wanted to get rid of it when that were you have a chance for a scarce good right you exchange for a scarce good because your desire is not in the in, in, in the goods that produce a lot your desire is in the goods that produce you know less and less um and that creates an interesting dynamic and you know and over time you know abstractly right not not talking about physical goods here abstractly um you think about power power is scarce right the presidency is scarce a chairman of a company uh, a CEO of a company is scarce so that create a, a, a bigger a bigger desire for individuals or for groups to fight over right and that creates a larger conflict uh in in, in the organization or in society as a whole uh it's often time fight over scarce desire not 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 like infinite um abundant type of desire yeah that's, that's an excellent point and i think maps on economics wonderfully you know we don't people for instance don't fight over oxygen very often oxygen yeah. is extremely vital to life right every breath we're constantly demanding it but it is so super abundant it's non-scarce mm -hmm. that we don't there's no mimetic acquisitive mimesis about oxygen, right? There's just too much of it, but we do fight over something like gold, right? Gold has no value to our existence in terms of our vitality. We don't need to eat it or breathe it yet. We've fought over gold probably more than any other like that and land. Probably the two things we fought more, uh, fought over more than anything else in human history. And yeah. it's exactly to your point because it's scarce, right? Just to try and unpack that a bit, you know, scarcity, we, we visit this topic a lot on the show and it's not, people often think it's purely a supply side phenomenon, but it's not, it's really anywhere that there's more net desire or demand than there is supply or means to satisfy that desire. So it's these, it very much is acquisitive mimesis, like almost in a nutshell, right? It's like, more people want the thing than there are of the thing than there is an amount of the thing. So that is scarcity. Um, and I wonder, you know, just on the topic of gold, this is something I wanted to just spitball with you, you know, in terms of how gold monetized the, the common narrative is, you know, it was originally a collectible people would, you know, find this in, in riverbeds and adorn themselves with it. And then eventually it became a store of value and then later a medium of exchange and finally a unit of account. And that was kind of like the path of the long arc of gold's history to becoming money. But I wonder how much, I mean, I feel like acquisitive amesis has to be a part of gold monetization in a way, right? Like people start, whoever starts to wear it, they adorn themselves with it. That triggers this mimetic desire, right? Other people imitating, right? Oh, this guy's wearing some gold on his, tunic or whatever. I would like to wear some gold in my tunic. And then due to that, just the natural properties of gold that it's very hard to produce. Like it's very, we're very slow to increase the supply of gold, for instance. So in that process that we are economizing over time, right? Maybe we're increasing output of everything else, food, uh, buildings, tools. So the purchasing power of that gold would be growing over time. So originally it's a collectible, but because we're increasing the output of, you know, food, capital, et cetera, that the purchasing power per unit, we're increasing that capital faster than we're increasing the gold supply. The purchasing power of each unit of gold would be increasing. So that would accelerate this mimetic desire, I would imagine, right? People see, 
other people have gold. Gold is making them more rich over time. They're basically, you know, ancient holders, holders, I guess you might say. And then that further uh, amplifies this desire for gold. And it literally, you know, elevates it to global, the global monetary standard by the 1800s, I think. Um, yeah. And, you know, depending where you draw the line, but basically gold had, had become dominant by then. Um, I, I, think, um, I think there's, you know, every single money um, that we have been used in, in, in the human history is derived from, I think it's derived from a bad desire, right? For example, seashell, right? Seashell is scarce on a mountain, but not in the sea. And that's why people use it as a currency, as a money in the mountain, not at the sea, because at the sea is abundant, at the mountain is scarce. And that over time kind of get abandoned. Why? Because technology improved. People can ship seashell to the mountain much faster and money increase. So that's collapsed in, in terms of um, supply and this last desire over seashell. And, and now we, we go, we, we're going to, you know, you know um, gold and silver, right? Gold and silver, hard to produce, it's scarce. Uh, and why it becomes a currency and the money is because there's a couple unique characteristic about it, right? Is you know it is scarce first and um, hard to produce, right? And you know you can melt it in any shape you want, um, and it's shiny, right? It's artistic. Um, also, it you know it it, it is a form of store value. It's a form of medium of exchange. All that good characteristic of, of money. Right, and that becomes desirable over time. It doesn't happen one day, right? When 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 you offer someone to go as a money, they sh- they tell you, you know, give me seashell. But you know, at, over time, people desire, and that desire increase. It becomes a, a kind of like a global money. Not only just Europe, Western civilization accepted, right? The the, the gold, the, the 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 whole world accepted as a money, right? You look at the Asian. Uh, China or you know Asian you know Egyptian whatever that they 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 accept go as the the de facto money, and that doesn't happen overnight. It happened in kind of like uh, reinforce the amount of desire. Like people desire it, and it's hard to produce, and people desire more. And ultimately, I think the best money is often the one that people most desire. It's a goods and services. It's a goods that most people desire and that becomes a de facto money i think gold monetization path is kind of like that right first people don't understand it and then it becomes the de facto global money because everyone desired it so i, I think it, you know i switched to fiat right fiat fiat become a dominant form of money because why it solved the one of the major problems with gold is this uh is portability Right, if paper money is much more portable, uh, you know, uh, you know, fiat, digital fiat is much more portable, um, but it, it doesn't solve the problem of scarce, scarcity. It's, it's abundant money, and that's why you see the, um, you know, but in, in, in past it's not like that, right? In past it's like fiat money can exchange for gold, but that's not the case anymore, right? It abandoned because the human kind of like civilization abandoned that concept. Like we, we will no longer convert our fiat into gold. Um, and we now carry just fiat, right? And that fiat is a representation of credit. Um, and, and, and we can't run that experience for a while if, because we trust in the centralized authority, you know, the central banks, right? And we believe they're not, not going to increase the supply and they're going to maintain the monetary policy as stable as it can be, but that's not the case, right? In 2008, we saw that. In 2020, um, we saw that, you know, there's a bridge in trust. Um, and, and the desire over the fiat money decreased a lot over time, right? Because why? It's very simple because there's abundant, you know, central bank can print as much as money as they could. And so why I, so why you want to desire over the fiat money? Right. right? There's no reason. Um, and then Bitcoin come along, right? And Bitcoin introduced um, this idea of fixed supply, 
is nothing else like it, right? It's, it's solving the uh, um, the problem of the gold, right? It's, it's basically a better version of gold and which, you know, over time, I think, as a desire kind of like reinforce itself, people desire the skills good over time and ultimately they become the most desirable goods in the world and then they become the money in the world. And I, I think all the good money, right? All the, all the backrock of economy and civilization is, is always based on this, this, this concept of this, um, this, um, this idea of the best scarce goods and that become the money of the society and economy. And that's how you're gonna build a different a, a civilization, right? And that money cannot be seized, cannot be, cannot, you know, cannot be cannot be corrupt, right? And and it is it's not gonna be um centralized. So I, I think there's a whole aspect, right, of what is a good, you know, good money. And ultimately, the good money is more scarce money. Yeah, it's a lot of great points there. And that, you know, the game or game, I don't know, this acquisitive mimetic pattern or phenomena, it's not something you can like opt in or opt out of even. You know, I'm thinking of China, India, they stayed on a silver standard the longest, but they basically lost purchasing power as a result of the rest of the world moving to a gold standard. So, you know, they're sort of trying to not play that game. They're trying to, you know, have their own standard, but they had an, they had a less scarce money ultimately, and that cost them, right? It, it cost them actual power in the world, purchasing power, and then ultimately political power. And so... Yeah, and you touched on a good point, like you're losing power, right? You're yeah. losing political power, you're calling power. Why are you losing the power? Because you're not holding the most desirable goods. Yes. That's why you're losing power. Um, yes. And then they have a, there's consequence of losing power over scarce good, right? And this is this is very like deep 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 down into like um, psychology or human nature. Like you as an individual, right, or as a country or as a company, whatever, right, as organization, you know, you you need to you need to possess the most scarce good. So that you you won't you won't be um, losing power over competitors, or you're not losing power over time. And the power can be like purchasing power, right? Political power, economy power. And if you lose all that, you know, by not holding the most desirable goods, you know, there's a consequence, and the consequence is there. Yeah, I'm reminded of the Ayn Rand quote that you're free to ignore reality, but you are not free to ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. No. Um, you know, it's basically the, the hardest money to produce is going to become the focus of mimetic desire. Let's talk about like characteristic of money, right? You have to make sure this goods um, satisfy all the needs of being the money, right? I think, until until you know Bitcoin discovered, um, there is no such a money like that, right? Gold is most um, close to it, and right. but Bitcoin as technology improve, it, it kind of like improve on, you know, the gold's characteristic, even even you know hundred x better or thousand x better, and um, and the roadmap of Bitcoin becoming, a, you know, a money of the world. You know, um, it has to be scarce and desired, desirable, and that's how monetization happened. It's how all the money becomes money, because because before they become money, they just commodity, collectible. And when they become money, um, you need you need all of characteristic, right? Portable ability, um, scarcity. Um, you know, in Bitcoin, you have programmability. Um, you have unseizability. Right, all this characteristic become a de facto good money, or, or a good hard money. Um, so over time, you know, as, as you know, because mimetic desire always reinforces each other. As you and me try to desire Bitcoin, right? It's just you and me, 
right? But the desire to create uh, at that moment when we both desire Bitcoin. And now you, if you look at it adoption, right? There are millions of people, corporation, governments desire over Bitcoin. And that kind of reinforces itself, kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. It's too large, too big. Um, it's, it's, the momentum is too huge. It's just hard to stop the monetization um, process. And that ultimately, why, why is that, right? Why is that? Why the momentum is so strong that you cannot even break it or even stop it, that even the government cannot stop it? It's because the, the desire over scarce goods is too huge. It's embedded in the human nature. It's embedded in the, in, in the, in the creation of the human history. It's just in you, right? It's in, in every single people's psychology. Right? People want what others want. Right. And, and, and that just the idea how um, you want Bitcoin. Right. And, and maybe then your neighbor wants it. Right. And they started to desire over it. And over time, if more people desire over it, it becomes the, the money of the world. And we're kind of like on, on that path already. It's just like how, how, how long we should take uh, to get there. Right. I think gold took like maybe a couple hundred years to get the global money status. Um, how how fast will Bitcoin go? Right, I, I think I don't know, but it it will be pretty fascinating. It will be pretty fast, I think, because it's digital, global, accessible. Um, but you know, ultimately, I want to go back to you know the, the idea of nomadic desire, and that's why this phenomenon has happened like this, and it happened before, right? It just follows the same pattern. It has the same monetization process um so you, you know i i, I think Gerard also touched on this a lot right there's a pattern in, in the myth there's a pattern in, in the jesus story and uh i think that always linked back to his you know idea of the desire um and same thing with the money that we are we are using um if looking at the history of the money right there's also a pattern and you find the magnetic desire everywhere in the process of monetization. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. And it, all of this makes me wonder too, because I've often, you know, often described money as our most important technology. Uh -huh. It has these, it has kind of a hybrid technology plus psychotechnology aspect and where a technology is something more like a physical laptop right. psychotechnology being something more like literacy or numeracy or rhetoric, even like it's a, it's a cognitive software, basically right. money. So it's kind of both in a way, right? Because it, it tends to be rooted in physical reality, like, like gold was, but then we also think in prices. So it, it kind of has both of these qualities. And so I'm always curious, like how, well, I guess one of the things I'm really trying to zero in on, with the show and with my work is how much does do changes in the character of the monetary technology influence changes in our mind, right? They're, they're linked together. And so I wonder how much of a, of a reciprocity there is between the two. And um, I'll read another excerpt here from your piece. You wrote that central bank digital currency is a type of programmable new money capable of tracking, monitoring, and controlling the flow of transactions. China has become the leading edge of its development. They have applied it to the creation of a social credit scoring program, a system of moral ranking that controls the behavior of citizens. 
Right. Some see the ultimate goal of the rollout of CBDCs as being to program people like central bank digital currencies. Okay. Humanity can now be reinvented in the image of the machine to okay. act as automatons like robots without feeling. And so it's just interesting to me that we're talking about just using two different tools for the same job, right? One is a form of money that okay. people can inject their agenda or they can program, right? They can program the money right. to money. try and engineer social outcomes. Right. Whereas the other form of money like Bitcoin is immune to that engineering, okay. the social engineering aspect. So what you're really right. doing is giving maximal power and autonomy to the individual user. Right. And so the, so Bitcoin would seem to empower and enable self-organization, which is what we observe in nature, by the way, right? Like there's not a lot of apes social engineering one another, right? They self-organize right. into tribes and, right. or right. whatever they call them, uh, a group of apes. I don't know what it's called versus in the C CBDC world, we do have human apes trying to inject their agenda right. in, uh, in ways that can influence the behavior of other human apes yes, towards yes, their yes. ends. So right. it's, it's this weird, it's almost like CBDCs allow one group of humans to make other humans a means to an end. Right. Yeah, subhuman. They, sub they will create a new class, right? New class, of, and, and, and then that you're right. So, yeah, they are, they are trying to create, and they, they are trying to give power to technology. So in the sense that the God becomes- Making the technology a God, yes. Right, right. And then the humans will be reduced to like animal, kind of like animal level, right? Um, hackable animals, as, as you know, Harari says it. Um, so it's, it's really, I mean, using money as a social contract, basically, and then deploying it by using game theory, you know, and then their game is, you know, using this narratives and uh, taking advantage of this uh, pretense of democracy, you know, which many people still believe that, you know, especially people in the West believe that, that they have, they live in a democratic society, right? So uh, using that to manipulate us, you know, exploit our empathy and uh, creating this uh, narratives that speak to us and make us feel good. And so that we will suck in and we would adapt their, their currencies. And I think it's a good thing. You know, we have to do this. We have to do this together to save humanity or whatever. But actually that plan is, is a very anti-human, you know, anti you know they, it's based on the anti-humanistic vision, in my opinion. The thing is that money is created by commercial banks. So all banks have to be a fractional reserve banks by definition. For example, if you had for reserve banking, where does the money come from then? You know, money has to be created by banks out of thin air, backed against loans rather than something like currency. Well, so, so here's fact, here's a crux of the, the namesake of the show here. What is money? <laughs> so what is gold in that <laughs> instance? Um, well, so what is money is a profound question. And it's going to vary across time, obviously. Now, in the West... People for a period of time thought of gold as money, but if you look longer, longer in history or across the across the pond to let's say China, people used uh, paper money for thousands of years, and as they did in other old countries as well. And if you go even further, money was things like things things like uh, sacks of rice or maybe even farm animals. So it's definitely a cultural definition that varies over time and across culture so it's a very you know it's a it's a very hard thing to pin down mm. today i think what people think of as money is you know it varies as well directly for example many people think about the pieces of paper they have in their wallet in the us these are federal reserve notes they think of that as money they also think of um let's say if they log into a bank what do they see in their banks they see you know deposit accounts. Those are bank deposits, liabilities created by a bank, and they think of that as money as well. Um, and some people think of Bitcoin as money. It really depends on who you ask. I'm curious as to why you don't think that we need an elastic money supply. Well, I think that um, money is a proxy for time and energy. And, you know, it increased the in 
Money increases in purchasing power to the extent that we increase the capital stock in the world or our productivity. And so if I'm holding a hard money and the world is economizing, as the purchasing power in my savings grows, I have an incentive to spend that. Like you always have an incentive to cons- to you have unrealized gains basically built into your savings vehicle. So the more purchasing power grows, the greater the incentive for you to spend and circulate that money. If there is a small group of people hoarding all the hard money and the, all the purchasing power is accreting to them, there's huge demand for liquidity in the marketplace. Well, that means there's a huge demand for loanable funds. So the natural interest rate is exploding, which is creating a huge incentive for the hoarders of hard money to lend that money into the marketplace. So I think I always come back to the free market as the ultimate referee or self-regulatory mechanism for all of all of the allocation of resources and capital in the world. So let me try to make it a little more straightforward. When the Federal Reserve buys US government bonds, you, say, you said they're just changing the composition of the asset mix, right? Because they're buying an asset right. that the US government can produce ad infinitum, which is debt, right? A promise to pay money in the future. And then the Federal Reserve produces another asset out of thin air called dollars. And they swap that, right? And so the exactly. debt goes onto the central bank balance sheet, dollars go on into the treasury's balance sheet, treasury starts spending. Now, in that particular transaction, is purchasing power being taken from all the people in the world saving in dollars in that case by the newly issued dollars that go to the government? I don't think so, no. Um, the way that I would think about this is that a treasury security is a form of money. If you think about it, if you have a hundred dollar bill, it's printed by the Federal Reserve by the, by the government. Is that really so different from a hundred dollars in treasury bonds? It's also printed by the government. Also, no credit risk. Also, very liquid. So, but treasury bonds really, in my view, are just kind of another form of money. There's just basically money that pays interest. So this is a circular thing, though, because if we say there's no credit risk on the U.S treasury bond because they can print money to pay the bond. Yep. Yep. Aren't we trapped in this circular logic of, oh, well, that's money. This is money. It's whatever the government says is money is money, but that's distinctly ahistorical, right? We have gold, which is a non-governmental money. We've had many non-governmental monies. So at what point did the government become the de facto authority on what is and is not money? Uh, I think of money, well, So money is whatever. So it could be decided on an individual level. For example, if I open up a store, I can only be willing to accept maybe payment in gold. Sure, I can do that. Um, so it is in part a cultural and a social agreement. I think it's not that the U.S. government just suddenly decided that dollars are money. I think that everyone in the United States and most parts of the world decided that dollars are money. The United States government, of course, likes this. But it's, of course, like you suggested, not really their call to make. Other people have to be willing to accept it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but... It, well, and but it took it, gold yeah. to make the dollar accepted, right? Because the dollar was once redeemable for gold, which is what gave it its original network effect exactly. as money. Uh, so I think what I think, in my view, the ultimate credibility, I mean, it... it so because the currency system is in part managed by the government, it's the strongest credibility in the government that the government will be able to manage it uh, faith, faithfully and well. And the gold standard was a way to uh, instill confidence uh, that the government wouldn't just mismanage it completely because you could always redeem it for gold. It's a constraint on government, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened i think in the past few decades is that confidence in government grew so strong that the government did not actually feel that they needed this extra constraint to make themselves more credible um but as i think we're seeing now they just you know maybe are not as credible as they used to be and so are kind of spending a lot more and creating a lot more money than uh than is prudent in great britain uh when we returned to the gold standard after the Napoleonic Wars, 
The price of a loaf of bread in 1816 was exactly the same as it was in 1900. There was no inflation because we were on the gold standard. You couldn't inflate because we were on the gold standard. And of course, as you will know, and of course, a lot of your followers will know that if you judge uh, gold uh, and the dollar together, and dollar being the reserve currency of the world, um, which was supposedly going to be the replacement, uh, that the spending power of the dollar has fallen to the tune of round about 19, uh, 96% against gold. So the actual spending power of the dollar has totally and utterly collapsed since the Nick Nixon closed the gold window. And when I'm lecturing at uh, universities, uh, Oxford or Cambridge or Durham or wherever it happens to be, I always carry in my pocket a gold sovereign, a gold sovereign. It happens to be dated 1905, but that's not the point. Uh, it's a gold sovereign. In those days, it was the equivalent to a pound coin. Now, in spending terms, that uh, sovereign would buy you bed and breakfast in a reasonably good hotel in London, Paris, New York, or Berlin, or anywhere else. Now, the point I try to impart to undergraduates at universities who are steeped in Keynesian economics, they don't get faculties which talk about anything else, uh, art generation after generation. I explained to them that that gold sovereign, if you took one today, it would still pay for bed and breakfast in a reasonably good hotel in London, uh, Paris, Berlin, or New York, because one today is worth 300 and, uh, 350 pounds, so let's call, uh, call that $400. So you can get a reasonably good hotel bed and breakfast in London for $400. I don't know about New York now. Last time I was there, it was murderously expensive. Uh, but you can do that. And that's when you don't degrade money. And I would argue that in 100 years' time, those, silver, those uh, gold sovereigns will still buy you bed and breakfast in any one of the major cities in the world, because gold is real money. Paper currency isn't real money. It's a promissory note from a bank backed by politicians. You couldn't think, could you, of a more useless piece of paper than something issued by banks with the backing of a politician. Totally useless. Totally useless, especially considering the promise that the promissory note represented has been permanently broken, right? It, it used to be a certificate for real money, for gold. And now it's backed by nothing. It's backed by, it's a confidence game, really. And it's a confidence game that we've seen fail time and time throughout human history. So almost everybody who is in politics in Great Britain has gone through the educational system, uh, which is run uh, on Keynesian lines. So we're talking about the second or third generation who doesn't understand money. There's no teaching about money in schools. Kids go to school, they're, they're talking about money. Uh, or what money is, uh, so they, they don't know anything about it. Um, so obviously, deep down, there is a fundamental desire to understand, and people know, which is the reason I wrote my book, The Magic of Banking, because it doesn't matter who you speak to, uh, whether he's a surgeon or a doctor or uh, whoever he may be, he doesn't really understand what's going on. He knows somewhere along the line he's being conned, but he doesn't quite know how it's happening. Uh, and so that's the reason I wrote my book on that, to say, look, this is what money is. This is how it works. Uh, and this is how it's being degraded. Uh, and, of course, uh, inflation, uh, of course, uh, only hurts, um, uh, hurts the little people, if you will. And most people don't understand why and how that's happening and of course it's debasement of the currency but if you ask your average man how this has come about they don't really know uh, and this is something that they've got to know we can't change anything till people understand what's going on what can't i mean it's such a pernicious problem because you've got people with no education about real economics we're steeped in this I don't know, democracy being like the holy grail of governance systems, and it's not, right? It's got its own incentive problems. And like you said, people don't understand money. So it's almost like they don't understand how the game is played, so they're getting played. So what, I mean, as, other than this educational work we're trying to do, is there something more systemic we could attempt? Is there is there another approach we should be thinking about to rectify this? Like. 
Now, what we have today in a kleptocracy is politicians who steal your money. And what really annoys me is they pretend it's for your own benefit. <laughs> Uh, and that really knocks me. Now, theft is theft. Now, if somebody came up behind you one dark night uh, and bashed you over the head and took your wallet, and as you were lying there on the pavement, blooded, if he then whispered in your ear as he took your wallet, don't worry, it's in a very good cause. I'm going to give it to my mother. You've still been robbed. The fact that he thinks it's going to a good cause has got nothing whatsoever to do with it. He's a thief. He's a thief. Uh, and, of course, he takes a cut for himself. He might give it to his mother, but he's had his hand in the till before he gives it to his mother, and then a few men. So all these people are thieves and crooks. So uh, we get what the people vote for uh, and how we change it, uh, as I said, going right back to the Athenian concept of democracy, is to change the game. Nobody in the public sector gets the vote. Nobody in the public sector gets the vote because that's going to vote for more public sector spending. If you're not in the wealth creating sector, you don't get a vote. You've got to be in the wealth creating sector and you've got to be a taxpayer. You've got to be a taxpayer. Uh, and then you would have, that would mean that, that at least half the electorate had a deep interest in what was going on and what money is and, and how much tax they're paying, so on and so forth. That is the way, genuine democracy. But we're wedded here People, even in conservative people, the people on the right, are horrified if you suggest it isn't one man, one vote. And I make another analogy there to undergraduates uh, and, and faculties. If you go to the pub in England or you go into a bar in America, let's say there's a dozen lads. It's a lads night out, right? Everybody puts $50 into the kitty or whatever it is, okay? To pay for the booze. And you go from one bar to the next. And a good, good time is had by all. Marvellous. Love it. Um, now, if you don't put your $50 in, you don't get a drink. Because you're not in the kitty. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't expect a drink, would you? You wouldn't expect it. You're not in the kitty. So you don't get a drink. And it's the same in society. If you don't put anything into the kitty, you don't get a vote. Because voting is basically about how the money is spent. But if you're not putting any money in, you can't have a vote. Now, for those people who say, oh, well, you know, you can't do this, can't do that, it's immoral, all that kind of bullshit. What is immoral is being forced to pay for your neighbour. You're working, he's not working. Being forced to pay for your neighbour, that is immoral. Mm -hmm. And you could do it another way so that people aren't disenfranchised. You could give the wealth creator three votes. And the guy who isn't creating any wealth, one vote. And that would rebalance mm. our society and our economies. And I think that would be at least something that should be even talked about. But these things aren't even being talked about, are they? Uh, how much longer can we go down this path of degraded currency, bankruptcy, uh, the highest uh, global debt ever? It's something like $270 trillion, isn't it, if you take corporate and mm. public these numbers are inconceivable, aren't they, to the public mind? Does anybody really understand that? You and I are in the money business. I don't understand those kind of numbers. They're miles over my head. So we've got to do something. But, of course, we won't do anything. It's got to get worse. But when it gets worse, what will happen? We won't have everybody saying, my goodness me, we should have been libertarians. The government have created all this mayhem because they're so greedy and crooked. They won't say that. They'll say we didn't have enough government. We need a firmer government. We need a different system. We need communism or we need fascism or something and all the rest of it. And more police, armed police, politicized police, and more FBI and all the rest of it. That's what's going to happen when it all collapses. And this is what's happened in history. It happened in the French Revolution. They got a new emperor. They got Napoleon. Uh, the Russians had a revolution and they got Stalin. Uh, the Germans had a sort of revolution uh, after the war and they got Hitler. You, you don't get libertarianism. You don't get free government. You don't get a free society with a revolution. You get more of the same. Uh, and that's where we're heading. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default. 
and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. We've always wanted to communicate. We've always needed to communicate. We've also always needed to transact with one another. But there's some common ground being established perhaps between the two on this, in this internet vision where you actually have money moving with messaging itself. Exactly. So you're paying with likes or getting paid for posts or whatever it may be. So it's almost like the, the, and Bitcoin obviously is very fundamental to this, but it makes money and language much more closely related. Because now with Bitcoin, you just, to, to know your private key is to own something. Sure. We've never had anything like that before. So this sure. is a second order, third order consequence of that unification. Is that the, like, is this the larger vision you see money and information sort of melding together in this creator economy? Absolutely. And, and I think that most importantly, it's the most important form of communication. Mm -hmm. Money is the most important message that you'll ever send to somebody. Mm -hmm. It's the most, it's the most important thing that you're going to be. There's a new definition speak. for money right there. Never <laughs> heard that one. Money is the most important message you'll ever send to somebody. Thank you. That's it's, a, it definitely carries the most weight for yeah. sure, because I would say, we all know actions speak louder than words, Yeah, but to actually accumulate capital, which money represents a, a claim on, takes many, 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 many actions typically. Yeah. So capital speaks louder than actions, which speaks louder than words. So when you talk about money speaking loudly, or I guess you could sum this up in a, a rap lyric, right? Don't talk, let your money talk for you, something like that. Mm. So yeah, money, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's money, a good. Money talks bullshit. I'm always trying to identify these answers to the what is money question. So you just dropped one right there. I had to highlight it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy we unpacked that. Because <laughs> I always thought about money in that way, right? It's the ultimate data. Yeah. It's the ultimate piece of data. Yeah. And then Bitcoin, most importantly. And, and I think that the brilliance of Lightning and Bitcoin is also this openness to it, right? Like we were at lunch today. And I created a, you know, receive invoice on Zion mm -hmm. and I could use five different applications to pay that invoice. And you use your moon wallet mm -hmm. to instantly pay that invoice. And I sent, you know, we could do that back. We have no connection to moon. Mm -hmm. We have no API. We have nothing. Right. We just have this open standard that we followed. Right. And now our application, this random social media app is now part of a larger payment network mm -hmm. that didn't require me to call any company. It didn't require me to do anything. It was just, hey, follow this open standard, and now you're part of the largest payment network ever created. It's amazing. That's, like, that, to me, is an unlock amazing thing. Yes. And if you think of, like, even V1 Zion, and this was the first app that we built, and this is not the V2 that we'll unpack a little bit more around identity, is that I launched that app with, I used all my own capital. I think I spent a couple hundred grand, not a lot of money put it out to the market to just see, are people gonna actually buy this thing? Like, is this something people want? We processed 120,000 lightning transactions between creators and fans in the first five months. And I never built a payment company in my life. I just used this open source code to mm. do that. And I think that's brilliant, right? You're talking about something 20 years ago, like PayPal took billions to produce. Yes, created trillions in enterprise value, whatever, mm. but it took billions to produce that payment network. Mm. I'm building a payment network off an open source system, being able to do the same and and speed. Did you see how fast that was? It was instant. It was yeah. crazy. I was like, damn, yeah. that was fast. And it's essentially final settlement. Exactly. Take possession instant of it, yeah. finite settlement, instant remittance. Because I can take that those UTXOs immediately. I can take that, not the UTXOs, but I can take those stats immediately and go buy anything I want. That's right. And it's over. Mm -hmm. I was just inspired with the correlation between what you were discussing in the realm of money and sort of what I'm talking about in terms of spiritual freedom, you know, yes. and uh, yes. it just definitely seemed to be a beautiful resonance there. So it was yes. nice to freedom, freedom is, well, one of the ways we describe money is like an, the ultimate instrument of freedom or an instrument of pure optionality. 
clearly yeah. only in a very pragmatic worldly sense it doesn't give you spiritual freedom obviously but there is some connection there um yeah. and the nature of freedom so there's definitely an overlap and i think people perceive money as a form of freedom right until such time that they usually have sufficient amounts to realize no it's right. not <laughs> yes 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 there is there's a bit of a, of a paradox there yeah you, you can gain Absolutely. a lot of worldly freedom only to realize that it's not um true freedom i guess yeah exactly so, um it might facilitate freedom but i think money tends to exacerbate whatever state you're currently in mm, yes right so if you have internal freedom prior to having money then for sure you're going to see an enhanced experience of freedom in all arenas but if you know and again it's just an assertion your internal state is more to do with anxiety fear concern then i would assert that that is equally going to be exacerbated by virtue of having more possibility but therefore seeing more of those experiences in more arena so right so it can amplify whatever state you're in <laughs> yes that's funny i heard tim ferris describe it once that money was a bit like alcohol that it would you know if you're naturally kind of a good natured person it might just give you a little bit more of that but if you're yeah. dark and brooding and upset then it's only going to kind of amplify that that side of your being yeah um, absolutely the big use case probably for money is that it propagates price signals in an economy right so it's it's actually distributing yep. information from the minds of individuals into the collective and back and forth it's this this reciprocal wave and uh but that only works well, to the extent that money can't be counterfeited, right? Once you start counterfeiting or double spending yep. the money, it propagates misinformation. I don't know if I want to use that term. It distorts price signals <laughs> and causes the misallocation of capital, exacerbating the boom and bust, et cetera, et cetera. That's all a data yep. problem at the end of the day. It's all a data problem. It's like you're talking about, it's a data issue. So um, how are you ever going to prevent the, um, the body populace if you can't help the individual control their individual data either a they don't know where it is how it's duplicated we have the usps example where it's photocopied and kept on a shelf for every communication or even if they do they can't do anything to stop it so you kind of help parties to help themselves you minimize the attack vector and then you have a more robust system and yeah there's trade-offs and yes it can be more difficult for law enforcement but guess what like um it's supposed to be difficult to deprive people of uh property, life, um, or, um, liberty, uh, or liberty. <laughs>